going to find our text in 1 Peter chapter 3. The wife and mother has so much to do with the attitude and the atmosphere of the home. The husband, as we learned last time together, is the head of the house. But certainly, as we're going to see today, the wife is the heart of the home. The most intimate of all relationships in life is marriage. Uh, The word intimate in Latin literally means inmost. And it doesn't have so much to do with sensuality or sexuality, intimacy, but rather going deeper, going farther. You know, kids say, well, they went all the way. No, you haven't gone all the way until you go to the inmost part of a person's life and being. And that is simply that the act of marriage is an expression of a deeper intimacy, a greater intimacy. God gave us marriage, this relationship, to fulfill both the man and the woman's deepest, most intimate needs for love, for companionship, for affection, for security, for strength. And your happiness depends upon designing your marriage or allowing God to design your marriage His way, according to the Scripture. And if you will live according to the divine design, build your life and your relationship, your home, your life, your marriage upon Christ and center your life in Him, you will discover that the relationship and all of the order and roles and responsibility in marriage will will come together beautifully in Him. In 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, to the wives specifically, the Word of God says, likewise, wives, be subject to your husbands, your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the Word, in other words, even if they are not Christians, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. And when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything which is frightening. And included in that anything which may be frightening is the whole idea of submitting to your husband. But the scripture is clear on this. And the first point that I want to make is that a happy wife is a submissive wife. Be subject to your own husbands. Paul says this clearly in Ephesians 5, our passage from last time together when we spoke of men loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. The scripture says, husbands love your wives and then on the heels of that, Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as unto the Lord. Key phrase, that's Ephesians 5, as unto the Lord. Uh, Colossians 3, 18 is another one. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, look this way. Can you imagine a more politically incorrect verse in all the Bible? And some of you are looking at me as I'm quoting these verses like I came from the planet Thaumatron. Because this is not what you're hearing in our culture. And this is not what even some churches are teaching regarding the roles and the relationship between a man and a woman. And yet, it is the clear, concise command of Scripture that wives submit unto their husbands. 
Uh, I know some of you want to push the delete button on these verses. But if you have a problem with what I'm about to say today, don't take it up with me. You need to take it up with God. Now, if I ever say anything that's, you know, doctrally incorrect and, 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 and wrong, you have every right to question what I say. <clears throat> but you can't question what is the clear directive of Scripture. Three times we've read it here this morning. Wives, submit unto your husbands. Last week we said to the men that on the issue of authority that you have to be willing to be under in order to be over. Men under the authority of Christ in their lives and women under the authority of their husbands as unto the Lord. So it's a question of willingness to come under. In fact, the whole idea, the whole word submit or submission means to come under. It's actually a military term. Just as a, a sergeant comes under the authority of the general, uh, we are to come under the authority of clear biblical directives in our lives. But the question, of course, is how do we apply this? What does this look like in real life, in your home, your family, your marriage, your relationship? What does it mean when it says, wives, submit to your husbands? Well, let me first tell you in no uncertain terms what it doesn't mean. What it doesn't mean is that in some way, in any way, that a woman is inferior to a man, that a wife is inferior to her husband. No, God created us male and female, and we are equal. We are equal. We are not the same. There's no category in the Bible for she men and he women. But male and female, he created them. And so God has given us certain roles and responsibilities, but this is, this is not a lack of equality. In fact, in the passage that we just read in 1 Peter 3, when it speaks to the husbands in verse 7, husbands, live with your wives in understanding ways, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. We are heirs together of the life that we have in Christ. And so when we say a wife, when the Scripture says a wife is to submit to her husband, that doesn't mean that you are in any way inferior to him. In fact, you may be superior to him at various levels and various abilities and gifts and so on. Secondly, it doesn't mean that you are to obey your husband if he demands or commands that you do something that is ungodly or unscriptural. We must obey God, the Bible says, and not man. Your first responsibility always, as a man or a woman, is to obey God. So if you are ever asked by anyone, including your own husband, to do something that is contrary to God's word, the answer is I must obey God first. Thirdly, Submission does not mean that you should stay in an abusive situation with a man who puts you in danger. I appreciated the fact that the mayor of the city of Dallas, Mayor Rawlings, recently held a rally for men to, to speak to the whole problem of domestic violence in the city of Dallas and, of course, beyond. In speaking to the mayor about it, I was complimenting the mayor at an event uh, in, in just in regard to this whole thing, and, and he was telling me some of the numbers, some of the statistics. And for example, did you know that in Dallas in 2013, there were 13,000 domestic abuse violence uh, reports in just one year? 13,000. That's just the ones that are reported. There were 19 murders directly related to domestic violence. Now, not all of these domestic violence charges were men beating up on women, but most of them were. Most of them are. And let me just say 
that any man that abuses his wife is no man at all. And this is a problem that should be addressed as it is being addressed in our culture and certainly in the church. So you have no obligation to put yourself or your children, your family in danger under the word submission. So what does it mean? Here's what it means. It means because as in the Lord or as unto the Lord, because you are a Christ follower. As a Christian woman, it means that you will willingly, voluntarily, and attitudinally, it's a big word, with your attitude, obey God by keeping your perspective and your place in the home as a supporter, a strengthener, a helper to your husband. The man and the woman can live together beautifully and honor God when we get it right, God's way. The, the most perfect example of submission, if you want to know what submission looks like, is the Lord Jesus himself. We're told in the Gospel of Luke that as a child, Jesus, we'll be talking about children and parents later, children obeying and submitting to their parents. But as a young child, Jesus submitted to his parents. That's Luke chapter 2. That he submitted to the authority of his parents, though he was the son of God. We're also told that Jesus Submitted to governmental authority. He said, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, give unto God that which is of God or belongs to God. We know that he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. He was the leader who served and the servant who led. And the most, outside of the cross, the most livid and living illustration of this is in the upper room when Jesus gathered his disciples. And John's gospel tells us, knowing that God had, the Father had given all things unto his hand. Wow. All things. Everything belonged to him. He was given all authority, all power. And so what did he do? Did he take up his throne? No, he took up a towel and humbled himself and knelt and washed the feet of those men on the night of his betrayal. Not because they deserved it, but according to the scripture, he loved them to the end because of his unconditional love. He washed their feet. So submission is not a four-letter word. Submission is not a dirty word. Submission is a Jesus word. And, and, and yes, by the way, submission is not just for wives, it's for Christians. It's for all of us. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 that we are to mutually submit to one another. Husbands, by loving your wives as Christ loved the church. And wives, by submitting and honoring and respecting your husband as unto the Lord. So the instruction here is that a wife is to submit as to the Lord. In other words, as if you were submitting to the Lord himself. As if you were doing it for him. This is not slavery or servitude, but an act, hear this, it is an act of pure devotion to Christ. An act of pure devotion and worship to Christ. Um, to follow the lead and to respond to the love of your man. Now, it's sort of like dancing. Now, 
People say, well, can Baptists dance? Well, some of them can, some of them can. I've seen a few who can. <laughs> and I'm not talking about, you know, the dance when, you know, people are standing 15 feet apart doing their own thing. But I like dancing, well, what is it, dancing in the stars or on the stars or with the stars? There we go. I have to say, as a husband, one year, one season, I sat with Deb and watched Dancing with the Stars. It was the year Emmett won, so I thought, okay, that's manly. I'll, I'll do that. So I actually rather enjoyed it. But, but I, I learned a little about dancing, and that is you've got to have someone who leads and someone who follows if you're going to be good. And that's true in a marriage. It's a divine dance in harmony with Him, with God. Someone leads, someone follows. In the plan of God, the husband is to lead, the wife is to respond and follow to his leadership. Now, you have to have some real skills to follow, especially some of the klutzes that you're following and dancing with, right? So it takes real skill not only to lead, but to follow. And so submission is not standing in the corner being a wallflower, saying nothing or speaking unless you're spoken to. Far from the truth. Uh, submission is active, not passive. It is responding. Uh, all right, let me, let me talk about something I'm more, I know a little more about, and that's, let's give an athletic illustration of this. Uh, basketball. Uh, did you know, by the way, that Deb Graham was a college basketball player, and a pretty good one, by the way? She was a point guard. And a point guard whether you're Deb Graham or Jason Kidd, has a responsibility, not necessarily to score all the points, but to lead the team, to execute the plays, and to make sure you put your team in a position to win by moving the ball and allowing people who can score the ball or who are in a better position to score the ball uh, to make the hoop. So. Let that be a lesson to us as regard to how this thing works in a marriage as well, as the husband, like a skilled point guard, should be distributing and leading, but not doing all, giving all of the offense. The wife is to respond and to give herself to her husband and to her family as she is given opportunity. I've already said that submission is a military term. It's like coming under the authority of one in charge. There is a chain of command in the military. And in this sense, there is a chain of command in marriage. Now, I've known men who want to take this scripture as a proof text to control their wives, to demand whatever they want. This is wrong, and it is spiritually abusive. In fact, there is no place in the Bible where a husband is told to demand and command that his wife submit. It's always voluntary and willing in response to the man's love that a woman is to submit. But even if he is not a believer, as Peter tells us here in 1 Peter 3, even if the man doesn't obey the Word of God, She's not to leave him, but to love him. Not to nag him, but to nourish him by her godly life. We'll get to that a little more a little later. But again, the motivation for this mission that you've been given, ladies, is as unto the Lord. You do this to please God first. As an act of obedience to God. Not that you will lose yourself or your personality, but that you together, men and women, wives and husbands, will blend your lives as a beautiful testimony, the two shall become one. Peter uses an illustration from the Old Testament, a great one that 
You, you saw in, in the movie, the Bible, the television production of the Bible, Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham was called by God to go to leave his comfortable life in Ur of the Chaldees, a, a, a pagan country without God, and, and to leave that, that security and to follow God in his call to make a new nation, a great nation. Abraham said, okay, where are we going, God? He said, I'll tell you later. And so Abraham went out by faith, not knowing where he was going. He only knew why he was going, and that was to obey God. So faith is when we obey God, when in spite of conditions or circumstances, we just obey God and trust God. And Abraham obeyed God and followed God, and Sarah picked up tent and moved the whole household, the kids with him. Now, when it says here in 1 Peter 3 that Sarah obeyed, this is verse 6, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. That word Lord there doesn't have the same connotation as you might think as Lord, as in God, Lord, but Lord is in terms of a place of honor. It was a term of endearment and respect. Calling him Lord. When did she do this? Well, I think primarily she did this when she went with him whether she believed or not, she trusted her husband enough that if you're saying God is sending us Abraham, I'm with you all the way. Bring this up to, to now when, when Deb and I got married, we were college students and we got out of Hardin Simmons and we came to Fort Worth, my hometown. Deb was raised in Mineral Wells, Texas, west of Fort Worth. So we were in a great place to go to Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. I was on my a home church's staff as an assistant pastor, and we had a little home. We had our first child there, and it, it, was, really, it was really great. And in about my third year of seminary, with about 20 hours or so to go, a church in Oklahoma, small town Oklahoma, western, southwestern Oklahoma by the name of Hobart, H-O-B-A-R-T, not Hobart, Hobart, Oklahoma, asked us to come and be their pastor. And we prayed together, and I prayed, and, and uh, though I needed 20 hours to finish seminary, I said, I'll come back and finish seminary. I'll make the drive, and we'll commute. The church said I could do that. So we went up to Oklahoma and was there for about three years, and then in another place, Duncan, Oklahoma, for another four years or so. But I have since thought I learned a, an incredible amount about my wife during those early years of my ministry. Um, now think about it. She's 23 years old, an 18-month-old baby. I haul her away from her home, away from mom, all the way up to this little town. Hobart's a wonderful little town, but it, it's a little town. Real little. 4,000 people. And oh, by the way, I leave her there during the week and drive to seminary and stay here all week. And I'm thinking, she's got... I look back on that, and yet, you know what? I never heard her complain. I never heard her question whether or not we were in God's will or not, or in some way try to hold me back. And, and that was the attitude that she took. I don't know that she loved being in Hobart, Oklahoma, as a young 23-year-old with a child, and not a lot to do. Of course, you know Deb, she found plenty to do. She was teaching school and working in the church. But my point is, I've known a lot of ministers, pastors, frankly, whose wives have held them back, just been resistant and not open to the call of God upon their lives together, and certainly their husband's call to preach the gospel. And, 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 and what, a, what a terrible thing that is if, if a wife is, is not helping but hurting. In fact, when God created the woman, he called her the helper. That's the same word used to describe the Holy Spirit. Not to be his competitor, but his completor. And so, to submit is, is to let the man lead. Because look, God's going to hold me and you men accountable. And ladies, you can trust God with that, that God is going to hold your husband accountable. 
for decisions that are made. I mean, it's like, it's like Adam in the garden. You can take this all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And, and, and when, when Eve began to converse uh, with Satan and she ended up being deceived and, and uh, eating of the forbidden fruit, Adam came along later after the colossal failure was done, the sin was committed. He participated in that sin. You said, well, you've got us in trouble. She ate the bite of the fruit. Well, he ate the rest of it. But you got to ask yourself, where was Adam? It's the man's responsibility to be the protector and pastor of his wife. Where was Adam? You know, was he out hunting with the boys? No, there were no other boys. But maybe he was just out, you know, for some me time. Or, you know, playing video games. I don't know where he was, but he wasn't where he was supposed to be protecting his wife. And the two of them got into great trouble and God held Adam responsible. It doesn't talk in the New Testament about us being in Eve. It talks about us outside of Christ being in Adam. God held Adam responsible. So wife, you need to trust God with your husband. Don't usurp his authority, but hang on the promises of God. Trust God to change your husband. You just love him and let him be God's man in God's time. Certainly don't manipulate him by pouting and crying and nagging. And that brings me to my second point, which is A happy wife is not only a submissive wife, but an attentive wife. The whole idea of respect here and paying honor as unto the Lord means to show attention and to give attention and to serve. That's the idea of submission and and to be attentive to your husband's needs. Now let me let you in on a little secret, ladies, about the male psyche. I mean, I'm a lot more comfortable talking to guys, frankly, on these subjects because, you know, I I know what a guy is like. Less on the other side, except what God's Word tells me. But as far as men go, did you know that most men struggle with self-esteem. Regardless of the exterior bravado, bravado rather, and regardless of maybe the external uh, crassness or crudeness or harshness, all that, all that ego. Many, if not most men, worry about, am I good enough? Am I strong enough? In your words, wives, carry significant weight with your husband. Either good words or bad words. I can tell you the words of Deb Graham, her words to me mean more than the words of anybody else. And so, ladies, Pay attention to him. Cheer him on. Cheer him up. Boys, men are like little boys, still wanting to do stunts for their girlfriends and get applauded. Contrast that to what the Scripture tells us not to do as wives. The book of Proverbs gives us some pretty strong counsel as to what you're not to say or do regarding your husband. Let's take a look at a few of these. Proverbs 21, 9, it is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. The word quarrelsome there means a belittling wife. Proverbs 27, 15, and 16, a continual dripping on a rainy day. Drip, 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 drip. And a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind 
or to grasp oil in one's right hand <laughs> or to put it in our world to nail jello to a wall. <laughs> Proverbs 21, 19, it is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. I'll let that speak for itself. Proverbs 12, 4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Amen. But she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones, like a cancer in the home and family. I love Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing, a, a good thing, and obtains favor from the Lord. I'm so grateful for the favor that he has given me in Deb. So women, speak life into your husband, not death. For life and death is in the power of the tongue. Don't chip away at him. Belittling him, questioning him constantly, attacking him, second-guessing him. This negativity, this kind of negativity will ruin a relationship. And you know what happens? The reverse happens that you desire with all the, you know, the attacking and if you're doing this, the correcting and, and the challenging and the belittling, that just reverses the field. That's a game changer because men will just shut off. They're not going to change by just more drip, 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 dripping. Not going to change. In fact, the opposite is going to happen. They'll burrow in. Or, unfortunately, go find somebody else who will build them up instead of tear them down. We often blame men, and rightly so, because they become passive and won't take responsibility for the leadership of their home, their marriage, their family. But frankly, I've seen in many cases over the years men who don't leave because they're so beaten down. How can he be a man if you're wearing the pants? How can he make decisions if you're always making decisions in front of him? How, how can he stand if you're cutting his legs out from under him? How, how can he lead if you're and be the man that God wants him to be if you're emasculating him by taking his role and assuming his responsibility. Now look, I know respect is not always merited, but for the Christian woman it is a grace that is given because love, real love is undeserved, it is unconditional, it is unmerited. And even if there are times when you correct your husband, and that's acceptable within the bounds of, of a godly relationship. And even, even if you have to, to challenge something, do it with love and respect. And pick your spots. Well, I need to wrap this up, but we've said two things so far. A happy wife is a submissive wife. A happy wife is an attentive wife. And here's one from 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, a happy wife is an attractive wife. Um, verse 3 of 1 Peter 3, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold or jewelry or gold jewelry or clothing that you wear, but let your beauty or your adorning, your attractiveness be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Back at the beginning of this message, I said the wife is the heart of the home. It's true at so many, so many levels because she sets, she's like, a, she's like a, you like the woman is like a thermostat in the home that sets the temperature and the atmosphere by the attitude, the adorn, what, what the Bible here is calling adornment, the beauty of the home. As, as a woman, you are to provide beauty and attractiveness to the home, class, if you will. 
Now, just on a purely external level, can you imagine what your house would look like if you left it up to your husband? Not so much. Just go to some of these guys' apartments that are unmarried and single, and you get, you'll get a brutal picture of what it looks like without the beauty and the class and the attractiveness and the care uh, of a woman. But, but on a more personal level, Peter tells us that a woman is to cultivate not so much external beauty, though you're not to let yourself go and you're to seek. I mean, there's no inherent value in looking like an unmade bed. And you ought to do your best. But look, if you think for all of us, this is a losing battle, this just trying to stay externally attractive. You know, I had a guy say to me one time, well, my wife doesn't look like she used to look. And I'm, I said, have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> Come on, really? So, I mean, all of us will, you know, there's no cure for father time except the work of God's Spirit within us who renews us day by day internally. And so, women, God says, you know, don't, don't let your appearance be just totally external. He's not saying don't wear jewelry or don't wear clothes. He says don't let that be your focus. And a Christian woman should dress with modesty and purity. But that's not your focus. Your focus is on not your clothing, but your character. Not how you look, but who you are. And let the internal drive the external, because I promise you, character shows up in your countenance, in your class, the way you look, the way you carry yourself. That's your character. That's your beauty. That's your strength. It's, it's, it's virtue. It's, it's, it's your smile. It's the twinkle in your eyes that comes from the joy of the Lord in your life. You know, there's a, there's a saying that uh, beauty is only skin deep, but ugly cuts right to the bone. <laughs> and God's grace will come from within and show up without. The beauty of your heart lasts a lifetime. What is most attractive to me, I mean, I believe Deb Graham's still the most beautiful woman I know. She's more beautiful to me than the day we met, but the beauty that she has comes from within. It's your conduct and your conversation. That's the real indicator of your beauty. That's why you are so essential to a godly home. You bring it beauty. And let your beauty be, as the gospel song said, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. You cultivate your relationship with God and watch your beauty. Bless your husband. Okay, one last scripture and then We'll wrap up. Titus 2, 4, and 5 says this. And so train the young women. So I'm talking to you young women right now. Classify yourself. He's talking to the older women about training the young women to do what? Love their husbands and children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Young women, your focus is always to be your husband and your children, your family. If you work, if you must work outside your home, it means you must pray and ask God for extra strength and energy to make sure you can still do your primary job. And your primary job is to be a wife and mother. And oh, there's no higher calling in life than that. If your husband is an unbeliever or a carnal Christian, the Bible tells us not for you not to leave him, but to love him. 
Not to push him, but pray for him. Don't lecture him, but live for Jesus in front of him. Verse, 1 Peter 3, 1, that they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. Your greatest influence is your life. Your words are valuable, but your life gives strength to your words. So if, if your husband is not a believer, maybe you're here alone today, uh, or, or if if your husband doesn't care about the things of God, is not obeying the Word of God, here's what you need to do. You need to stay faithful yourself. You come to church even if you have to sit by yourself. You come to church and bring your children with you. You stay faithful to God. You pray and wait on God. You so live in the power of Jesus Christ that your husband will see your faith And by God's grace, respond to him and to you in faith. And I've seen it scores and scores of times through the years when a godly, faithful wife introduces by her influence her husband to Jesus. It's awesome. We did some video this week, some of our couples that I believe are illustrative of the points that I'm making. Submissive wife, attentive wife, attractive wife. It's a a minute and a half, but it's, it's worth a watch as we close. Watch the screen. The way that I know that uh, she cares about me and loves me is, you know, I've, I've worked for many years. I've always, um, been happy to go to work and when I leave work I always will text her I'm on my way home I get a text hurry come home to me Um, she's waiting on me and so I know that I have my woman my wife is waiting for me at home she's faithful to me Um, she's a great mom she's always been a great spiritual leader within our home too so I depend on her every day for advice and for friendship on a day-by-day basis it is anticipating what I might want or what I might need. And sometimes it's, it's an object that I need, but sometimes it's something that just takes care of me. It can be something as goofy as, you know, making ice cream for me. She demonstrates that I'm valuable by, she's always made it clear to me and to our uh, girls that dad is gonna, is gonna lead and I wanna lead. Telling me uh, how important and, and being looked to is saying, look, I need you. I need your input. I need your investment in my life. Sally has always made me feel like I'm the El Queso Grande, the big cheese, the number one, numero uno. It's been, as a godly Christian wife, she has just been, she has set the example for uh, lifting me up and making me feel good. Now, I'm not saying she doesn't, uh, you know, whoop me over the ears and and (laughs) box me and keep me lined up, which is what I need. She is an incredible encourager and uh, a great example setter uh, of a Christian wife and what a godly mother should be. In Casa Grande, huh? (laughs) Here it is. If you want a Christian home, it starts with you being a Christian and living according to God's word and in God's will. And if you want Jesus in your home, you must first invite Jesus into your heart by becoming a Christ follower. And I'm going to invite you to do that. If you don't know him, to believe in the one who lived and died and rose again so that you can have eternal life and abundant life. So you can know how to live forever. Go to heaven when you die, but also that You can know how to live today. A relationship with God establishes the opportunity that you have for you to have relationships with your husband, your wife, your family, and with others that matter and are eternal. 